Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today I discuss 10 things that vintage gentlemen just were better than modern men today. And I'll show you what you can do to adapt their style, be inspired by it, without looking like a grandpa. <laughs> Whenever I look back at old films, magazines, or even family albums, one thing is painfully obvious. All these people look so elegant and they were dressed so well, even though they might have just been a farmer, or a store clerk, or just an everyday person going about their business. Just compared to today, when you walk around outside, you see people with a hoodie, sweatpants, and some trainers. Remembering the summer, a pair of shorts with flip-flops and a stained shirt. So you might be wondering, how did Cary Grant, Sidney Poitier, or William Powell, or even your grandpa, manage to look so good? Today, I try to answer this question by looking at 10 different things vintage gentlemen did that many men today don't anymore. That being said, there's nothing that keeps you from reviving those great sartorial habits. Of course, this is just our subjective opinion, and you shouldn't take it personally, but I hope that by the end of this video, you'll say, I'ma take your grandpa style. I'ma take your grandpa style. No, for real. Ask your grandpa, can I have his hand me down? First, let's kick it off with a very clear example, black tie. No matter whether it's a vintage fashion plate, a painting, or James Bond in a movie. They all look so irresistibly dapper and handsome. That's especially true when compared to what passes as black tie today at the Oscars, weddings, or gala events. So the big question is, what went wrong? Back in the day, chances were that even as a middle-class person, you owned your garments and didn't just rent them. Okay, maybe with the exception of the 60s and 70s, when men started renting stuff. And looking back at those pictures, just think about those ruffled shirts and gigantic bow ties. Yes, once men started renting tuxedos, things went downhill quickly. But even just a few decades earlier, men did not rent. Even the blue-collar Popeye from 1956 owned a tuxedo. Because renting a tuxedo is so popular these days, we wanted to see what you actually get for your money and just take a look at this. No, my inseam did not shrink before we provided the accurate measurements and when we filmed this video, but it was just a complete shit show. To learn more about rental tuxedos and what you can buy instead, check out this video here. So by investing in a tuxedo, men could guarantee that they got something that actually worked for them and their body that they were comfortable in and that they could wear, clean and enjoy. Realistically, men back then had to spend more of their income on clothes because the production had not been shipped offshore. Of course, also more people wore tuxedos, which meant there was more variety in the styles that they could buy at a regular store and the accessories. I mean, they had different bow type shapes, different sizes, slim ones, big ones, pointed ones, and so forth. If you go to a store today, you're lucky if they have a single kind of bow tie that you can actually tie yourself and that's not pre-tied. Otherwise, you just look like a boy who goes to prom. If you've never tied a bow tie before, no worries, we got you covered. We have videos for beginners that are easy and we have more advanced ones. We also offer a range of bow ties that are all self-tie in shapes that are guaranteed to work for your face shape. Of course, it didn't stop there. They had evening waistcoats or cummerbunds, boutonnieres, pocket squares, socks, evening shoelaces, and so forth. Sadly today, most men lack the knowledge of black tie and what to put together. Fortunately, we have the most comprehensive guide on that matter that tells you everything about the history, what you have to wear, and even if you have just five minutes, take a look, we'll walk you through what looks best on you and why you should wear it. Well, aren't dress codes really a thing of the past, you might think? Aren't we all individual today? Well, yes and no. Dress codes had the idea of helping you to put something on that was acceptable so you could focus on the company rather than being self-conscious about your outfit and whether you're over or underdressed or just dressed appropriately. Back in the day, gentlemen had the option of white tie, which was arguably the most elegant thing for them to wear. And looking at that, it is really stunning. Every man I've ever seen wearing a white tie tailcoat just looks awesome. Now, why is that? 
well, the dress code is very strict and there's not much room for individuality other than maybe the bow tie shape or the color of your pocket square. Black tie on the other hand gives you a little more variety in terms of the color, maybe a midnight blue or something in really dark navy with black face silk lapels. Maybe you want different slippers in velvet or on the bow tie front. But after all, it's still rather limiting, but because of that, it's much easier to look dapper and handsome. The second thing vintage men wore better were shoes. We already discussed in a different video why men stopped wearing dress shoes, but back then, obviously, they did. And dress shoes not only had an elegant last, but they were also made of higher quality materials than sneakers today. That, of course, was reflected in the price. Again, shoes weren't made offshore, and a nice pair of floor shine in the 1940s cost you $10. Considering that the annual family income was $1,600, that's the equivalent of a pair of floor shine today that costs $400. Now, floor shine, of course, you can get for a lot less, and we did a video between the difference of $100 and $500 shoes, where the floor shine only cost $100. But if you get a pair of $40 shoes today, you get what most men wore back in the day. Now, if you ask any man on the street how much they spend on their shoes, the average will definitely not be $400. At the end of the day, if you look back, vintage gentlemen were forced to buy more expensive shoes, but they also lasted longer and the cost per wear was low. Today, we're constantly tempted to buy that next pair of low quality shoes because it's in line with the latest trends, but it leaves us unsatisfied and with something that we have to throw away that can't really be repaired. Now you might say, if I have to pay $400 for a quality pair of shoes, I can only afford to have one or two pairs and that's not enough for my style. It's not varied enough. Well, in that case, it's great to start out that way. And if you want a different look, you can get different colored shoelaces, which really change the game. A black pair of Oxford may be perfect for an interview at a bank, but with a red pair of shoelaces, it makes all the difference. And now you can go to a cocktail party and look dressed to the tee. Of course, back then, men didn't have the chance to order online. And even though Sears was around, they would typically buy their shoes at the store. They also had more widths and shoe lasts that allowed for a more comfortable fit. Shoes were also made that they could be repaired at a local cobbler. Try that with your Nike sneakers. And also because vintage men had to spend so much money, they took care of their stuff. They polished them, moisturized them, put their shoes on shoe trees, and had a few quality items in their wardrobe. Well, today, most men don't wear shoe trees. They don't care about their stuff. When a sole is worn down, they'll just toss it and buy a new pair because the repair locally for a pair of shoes that costs 70, 80, or $100 would probably cost about the same of a pair of new shoes made abroad. Some of course, back then, you were so proud they told their mothers about their new shoe purchases. Hi, Mom, what do you think? Look at my shoes, aren't they great? My God, you look like a gangster. The third thing vintage men looked better in was generally their socks. Now, you might think, well, they had navy socks and black socks and maybe gray socks, but that couldn't be further from the truth. They actually had socks in a variety of colors and patterns, sometimes with hand-embroidered clocks. Trying to buy or sell something like that today would cost you a small fortune. Most men back there wore over-the-calf socks that stayed up, or they had sock suspenders for their shorter socks. So the look of the sock was never crumpled up, but always smooth between the shoe and the hem of the pants. If you buy a $4 pair of socks today, they're gonna be thicker, they'll have more synthetic materials, which makes your sock warmer than old natural materials that were worn back then, and overall, not as sophisticated looking as with a higher quality pair of socks made out of natural materials. To learn more about the difference in socks, check out this video here. If you look at old advertisements or fashion magazines, it is stunning how much the market in socks has changed today. If you go to a regular department store or even in haberdashery, often the selection is rather limited and dim. Of course, there are many men who like to buy their socks in a multi-pack on Amazon or at Costco. But as this Haynes ad accurately describes, buy cheap socks and you'll pay through this hose. Ironically, Haynes today is not what I would describe a quality sock anymore. I mean, I get it. Some men may be intimidated by all the different sock colors and the patterns and how you can combine them, but we got you covered. 
we have this video and a guide on how to pair socks with shoes that shows you how you can elevate your outfits with a simple thing such as socks. Soon you'll be saying, Oh, suck it to me, baby. The fourth thing vintage men were better than men today are trousers, slacks, pants, or whatever you want to call them. So again, the question is, why did they look so good? In my opinion, it's because they all had high rise trousers. What does it mean? Your pants actually sat on your natural waist, around your belly button, not just on your hips. Not only did it make your pants more comfortable, but it also elongated your leg line and made you just look better. Some argue it had to do with the fullness of the trousers. But if you look at the 1910s or 1920s, pants were slim, maybe similarly slim to today with a slim hem. By the 1930s, everything got a lot bigger and fuller. But what all of those decades had in common were high rise trousers that set at a natural waist, no matter how full or pleated the pants were. And of course, the pants fit the people who are wearing them. They weren't super tight and they weren't gigantic either. I mean, just look at me and my thighs. I have these big thighs, so I generally can't wear off the rack flat front pants because they always make me look like a pressed sausage. Because of that, I typically wear pleats or I have to go custom to get a pair of flat fronted pants. Another reason why men back then looked better is because they either wore suspenders or belts. Suspenders have the advantage that your pants rest on your shoulders, so you can actually have a little more room in the waist for a big dinner or a lunch, but throughout the day, they will always hang at the exactly same height, which allows for more comfort. Belts, which became much more popular in the 30s and in the following decades, can also help you keep your pants up, but it's much easier if you have that high waistline because it just grips your body better than just over the hips. If you're curious about how pants should actually fit so you look your best, we got a video for you. Of course, it helped men back then that fashions weren't as short-lived as they are today and they also weren't as extreme. I've never seen skinny jeans, for example, back then. That being said, the 1970s bell bottoms, ouch. Or just look at these hyper flare jeans, they're more like Oxford bags. In all honesty though, I've never seen someone wearing like this on the street. I've seen plenty of skinny jeans though. Another god awful trend are these tactical cargo pants and whatever is going on here. So if you want to look your best in pants today, take a page from history and one, get a pair of high rise trousers, two, make sure they work for your body type and three, go to the alterations tailor and make sure pants have enough of a fabric reserve to let them out in case you gain a few pounds or other things happen. It's always easier to take pants in than to let them out, but you also can't take a pair of pants that is three sizes too large and make it fit. It will just look awkward and your pants and your pockets will be in the wrong spot. Another thing vintage men wore better were dress shirts. If you look around today, most men wear shirts in either a solid white or blue for business wear. For casual wear, sometimes you see these bright tones of turquoise or red or all black is also very popular or maybe denim shirts. No, we don't have anything against denim shirts. We've made a video about it, but they have their time and place. If you take a closer look at the dress shirts that were available to men back then, you'll probably be surprised. They weren't all just white and light blue, but there were lots of subtle tones, such as pastel, green, or yellow, peach, lavender, orange, and so forth. Moreover, they had a lot more patterns, subtle micro patterns, checks, maybe little houndstooth ones, interesting stripes, and sometimes there was just a subtle contrast, so from afar it would look like a solid, but from up close it revealed to be more interesting. Now, even though many of the rec vendors don't sell shirts in a bright color palette, fortunately, we now have lots of custom offerings on the market, so you can make sure your shirt wardrobe is more varied and not just blue and white. Of course, the big question is, what's the ideal shirt selection for you? And it depends on your lifestyle, your climate, and your taste. We created a video to tell you what shirts you really need and try to guide you in the right direction so you end up with something that works for you. 
And no, it's not just about the color and the pattern, but also about the collar shape. Back then, companies like Aero educated men and explained to them what type of collar would work well with their face. For example, if you have a big round face, having a small collar will look odd. Or if you have a very small head with a big collar, that's also off. Why? Well, a collar can accentuate your feature or level it out. To learn more about what collar shapes work best for you, we got you covered as well. Frankly, we have an extensive library about all things shirts, so you'll find the answers you're looking for there. And maybe by the time you're done watching all of them, you'll love dress shirts just as much as Daisy from The Great Gatsby. <laughs> Never seen such beautiful shirts before. Another reason vintage men looked good were they knew how to put together odd combinations. Today it seems if you look at the Oscars or our big events, monochromatic outfits are often popular because that's probably what their style advisor told them to wear. Now keep in mind, back then everything was more expensive, so men could only buy fewer items. If they wanted a different look, they had to maybe take parts of one suit and combine it with another, thus leading to all sorts of interesting combinations. For me, it's a pure joy to look at the old fashioned illustrations, looking at the different textures, colors, patterns, and style men would wear back then and layer up. It has a depth, it has an interest, and it's definitely an expression of their personality. Now, if you're interested to learn from those vintage illustrations, we created a book that does just, just that. No, we don't have it printed, it's an ebook only. You can really tell men didn't just take the easy way out and wear a pair of chinos in a solid tone with a solid polo shirt all day. They put a little more effort into it and it paid off. The other thing men did back then was to actually have neckwear. Now, neckwear never had a practical purpose, or hardly ever it did. It was always decorative. Back then, men just accepted it as part of the general dress code. Today, most men associate wearing a necktie with discomfort. I mean, back then, men even wore ties when they played tennis. Can you imagine that? Yes, there were lots of neckwear options. They had wools, they had silks, they had cottons, and later rayon and nylon as those fibers became more popular. But overall, the average man couldn't afford to have hundreds of ties in their closet. So it was important to have something that was versatile for them. They had ties for work, ties for play, and then of course, bow ties, evening ties, and whatever they needed. Interestingly, going through these old photos and illustrations, you never see men wearing bright, boldly colored ties in pink, green, or any other colors. Today, if you look at TV hosts, for example, they always have these bright orange, yellow, red ties that really stand out, and it's almost too much contrast, and sometimes just glaringly bright. Now, even if you compare vintage tie wearers to modern tie wearers, you'll notice a difference, and it is the size of the knot. Today's ties are often very thick, and it's not the fabric that's thicker necessarily, but the interlining between the fabric. So if you tie a knot today with a regular tie, the smallest knot is an oriental knot or a four-in-hand knot, and even then, the knot is quite big. Back in the day, the interlining was thinner, so if you wanted a thinner knot with your collar or if that was your style, you could get that result. If you wanted a bigger knot, then you went with a double Windsor or a Balthus, for example. That being said, if you don't know how to tie a tie, we have a series of the most common ones, how to tie them, very easy step by step. Now, looking back through some vintage ties, there were plenty of ugly ties. Not everything from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s was great. But I think men had a better understanding of choosing the right tie for the rest of their wardrobe and their face and collar shapes. But it wasn't just about ties. Men also wore scarves or mufflers that were decorative, or maybe a handkerchief or an ascot. I mean, just think about the last time you saw a man wearing a neckerchief on the street. I can't. Maybe sometimes you'll see someone that wears an ascot, but even that happens only once every blue moon. However, the men who wear an ascot today definitely stand out and people notice right away. Why? Well, it's unusual 
And if someone wears an ascot, chances are to do so with confidence and it automatically gives them an aura that other people don't have. If you're interested in upping your neckwear game, we have many tutorials ranging from how to tie an ascot to 12 essential ties every man should have. Don't let Fred have all the fun. You know, throughout the years, a lot of people have asked me, Fred, why the scarf? And I always tell them the same thing. Why don't you mind your own f***ing business, pal? Of course, one of the most obvious reasons vintage men looked better is that they wore hats. Today, most men don't wear a formal brimmed hat anymore. They maybe wear a baseball cap or a beanie when it's cold outside, but not a bowler hat or a fedora or a homburg hat. Now, why did men stop wearing hats? We got a video dedicated just to that question and you can watch that here. Now, if men today decide to wear a hat, oftentimes they don't quite look like Humphrey Bogart wearing a fedora. Why is that? Well, it starts with the fact that back then there was a culture on hat wearing and people learned what to wear and what not to wear based on how they looked. Today, rules of hat wearing are either unknown to people or maybe ignored. On the one hand, a hat can be a great personal style hallmark, but it can also be a detriment if worn incorrectly. Finding a hat that works for you is related to your body type and face shape. And we'll walk you through step by step how you can find the best hat for you. Yet another thing, vintage men were much better than modern ones are overcoats or outerwear. A very popular jacket these days for cold winters is a Canada Goose down jacket. But in fact, it's not nearly as warm as my heavy overcoats. And no, they don't have any down. They're just made from heavy, durable wool. Now, if you buy an overcoat today and it says it is heavy, it usually means about 18 or 19 ounces in weight. Back then, they were like 30, 36 ounces in weight. So almost double. Yes, we're dealing with climate change, but there's plenty of places where it gets still really, really cold outside. And a heavy overcoat material doesn't just keep you warmer, it also drapes better and looks better. And that's the reason they just look better when they wear an overcoat than when we wear a down jacket today. Because more people wore overcoats back then, there was a greater variety. There were day wear varieties that were formal or less formal. And there were evening overcoats. Trying to find an evening overcoat today is really difficult. Even tailors may not know what to make for you because none of their other customers ever request such a garment from them. Also, the fabrics back then often were made from yarn with multiple colors in them. That allowed you to combine it with various different colored items, but it always seemed to work. Now, overcoats today are often black, charcoal, or navy, all solid, that's it. I know today sometimes you can find overcoats with zippers and hoods. Now, if you just look at the classic varieties, such as an Ulster, a Palato, and a covered coat, and there are many others, you will look dapper. Yes, if you watch some other videos, you'll probably know I just can't get over overcoats. What? I can't do puns? We'll workshop that one. Last but not least, I think vintage men wore pajamas, sleepwear, and robes much better than modern men. I mean, today, people wear a hoodie and sweatpants at home. Back then, they had these really cool looking pajamas in bold patterns, or maybe a dressing gown or a nice robe with some Albert slippers. Were they comfortable? Absolutely. Were they warm and cozy? Yes. It just looked so much better than sweatpants. And yes, I know you could say, well, no one will ever see me in my sleepwear. And you may be right, but it's a general mindset. And I think if you take care of yourself and invest in yourself, you'll show up differently even when people can see you. When I browse through old fashion magazines, I notice there's quite a few ads for sleepwear, for slippers and garments of that kind. Now, you think about it, if you spend about a third of your life or more in bed or in your bedroom, you might as well invest in that type of clothing. When you watch old films or even a modern period drama like Downton Abbey, you'll see that people just looked better in their sleepwear. I mean, just imagine if Lord Grantham here would have worn a pair of underwear with a t-shirt. It wouldn't look nearly as good. Not sure where to start? Of course, we have a guide to sleepwear for you.
Now I know we already got 10 things covered, but as a bonus item, so to speak, I think men wore watches better back then. Typically, they were smaller, they weren't just all metal and flashy and bling, but they often wore more dress watches. But no, that wasn't the only watch they wore. Think of the Reverso watch, which came up, and we got a whole video dedicated to that watch here. So men knew they needed different items for different occasions. Whereas today, I think men oftentimes wear their Rolex, no matter if they show up for black tie or if they're in their flip-flops on the beach. For every occasion, there was a different watch. And vintage men used to treat a watch like an heirloom that was passed down in their family for years to come. It was less of a status symbol than it is today. Frankly, I believe that many men today try to use a watch to flex or to use it as a status symbol rather than as something that is part of their entire outfit. Hopefully, we've showed you that the style of the past isn't gone forever and it can be yours with a bit of effort, creativity, and know-how. So my outfit today isn't truly vintage. I think the tie is vintage, but it's not 100 years old or anything like that. So the jacket I thrifted, it was custom-made, but it has this nice window pane on dark blue. It's a little more casual because it has lighter colored buttons and elbow patches. I definitely went for a 1930s-ish look with a pair of off-white flannel trousers with a fishtail back and suspenders. These suspenders are a bit whimsical and feature dogs. But they're interesting because in the back they have leather tabs, in the front woven ones in brown and white, which I continued to my shoes, which are Alan Edmonds Spectators model Bel Air in brown and white. My socks are two-tone socks. They are solid in like white and navy, so it picks up the color of the blazer, providing contrast between the shoes and the pants, and thus tying the outfit together. My shirt is a pastel lavender one, as men would wore in decades gone by. From afar, it looks like a solid, but it has a subtle herringbone pattern. I'm combining it with a vintage motif tie and a boutonniere, which also picks up the tone of the shirt. I skipped the pocket square because I felt like between a window pay pattern, the flower, and the tie, I already had enough going on. The cufflinks are a pair of vintage enamel cufflinks that are lighter in color. And even though there's no yellow in other parts of the outfit, it's very close to the color of the window pane. <laughs>